Yet another question from the community, our favorite. Yes, the best. Okay, and I, I like this one. I have a bias for this one, so I'm going to say that going in. Okay, here we go. Yeah. My, my question is, I'm trying to get strong and was wondering what would, what would be better, strict movements with bands or kipping? I know strict movements take more time, but what is the benefit slash comparison for a CrossFitter with kipping and strict movements? I've always heard that kipping was for competition, but I don't know if that's correct. How often should I mix in strict versus kipping movements? Does kipping help my strict movements or is it the other way around that strict movements help my kipping? Any more insight would be greatly appreciated for the average Joe. Oh boy, this is a great question and one for the ages. And I would say that there's a lot more meat on the bone here than originally, uh, than it originally appears. You know, you can scratch the surface with this and get pretty deep. And, and, you know, the first question that immediately comes to my mind when somebody says, I want to get strong, I can spin out on that all day. What does that mean? Does that mean that you want to be able to manipulate your body weight a little bit more? Does that mean that you want a better one rep max? Mm -hmm. Does that mean something else that maybe lies kind of between those two things? What is it that you mean when you say strong? So that would be my first question. Reading between the lines, it sounds like this individual is asking, how do I develop the ability to do more pull-ups? That's kind of what I thought as well. And so if that's the case, well, then there's some pretty, pretty natural approaches in my mind. But I think the broader question of kipping versus strict can apply in a lot more areas than just the specifics of pull-ups. So let's get that out of the way first. Um, You know, okay, I'm trying to develop my pull-ups. What's the best approach? Maybe we start there. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, uh, I think that if somebody doesn't have the control to do a strict variation of the movement, you should be wary about doing a bunch of kipping development because you can't control the range of motion yet. And what you're asking yourself to do with a kip is to offload some of the strict demands from the muscles that might be responsible in that more strict movement Uh, you're offloading that to some bigger, stronger, more powerful muscles that are very capable of pushing you through a range of motion that you might not have developed yet. Mm -hmm. And you got to be careful in those uh, circumstances. So, you know, yes, I think kipping has its place for sure. Even if you don't have a ton of the strict variation, I think you can start pretty quickly incorporating that. But I would bias towards strict first. That's my general rule of thumb. Yeah, my general one too is, and again, if we're staying with with pull-ups as well, I think strict movements are phenomenal. Phenomenal, foundational, beneficial, incredible building blocks on top of which you can add a movement such as kipping that increases the neurological demands of the movement turns turns it also into a you know you can make pull-ups a conditioning exercise where you're winded Mm -hmm. as if you were doing sprints which traditionally does not happen if you're just doing strict pull-ups and hit failure and hop off the bar so it will open your world to a whole bunch of other aspects of training that are wildly beneficial but like you said as well i don't think you should go down that road until you've got a i'm a fan of getting a good strict base first whether it's pull-ups dips fill in your blank whatever the 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 best movement is because i kind of liken it to you know the kipping movement is going to be faster more dynamic more technically complicated and potentially fatiguing you in more areas than just local muscular fatigue in Mm -hmm. your lats you know cardiorespiratory as well so I don't think it's a very good well, idea to be... Or, or to kind of to pause there, sorry mm. to cut you off, but um, not only more fatiguing of those muscles, but you can continue on once those muscles have been fatigued. And that's something, especially in the beginning, that I think many people aren't necessarily in touch with. And so you can put yourself in a pretty serious hole Easier because you can continue... Exactly. Yeah. And if you're not prepared for that, that can be, that can be a rude awakening at best you hit, you uh, in hit, the next you day hit, or two. You hit the wall on a set of strict pull-ups, you've got You're no done. choice yeah. other than to hop off the bar and just flat out rest. You get into that same area you know, quicker than you should, let's say. You rushed into kipping and you might be 
dancing with the devil for grip <laughs> grip strength and what's happening to your last but you've still got one or two good hip pops left exactly. and you're going to get yourself up there and you might not have anything left for the ride home <laughs> and yeah. then you're going to be you know coming off that bar in a way that you don't want so developing that strict strength i would say is is a great primary focus and we can dive into a whole bunch of different ways to do that you know there's a difference between if you have zero pull-ups and you're looking to get into that one to five range, or do you have five strict pull-ups and you're looking to get into that 10 to 12 range, you know, so on and so forth. There's some overlap, but but depending upon where you are, my gut response would be both are fantastic. I do both. Focus on the strict first. Yeah, I agree. Now, if we expand the conversation to get past, hey, I just want to get better at strict pull-ups and I don't have that many yet, mm -hmm. and we start talking more I guess, holistically about what kipping offers. Uh, in my opinion, I think we need to start thinking about two different qualities that we're trying to develop. And they have a lot of overlap and they definitely influence each other positively. But if we start thinking about strength in isolation and power in isolation, we can start mm -hmm. to see where each starts to come into play. So if we're looking at the physiological characteristic of strength, what we're talking about is the maximum number of motor units that can contract to achieve a goal. So in the deadlift, you know, I'm trying to get maximally recruit as many muscle fibers as possible to aid in me breaking the bar off mm -hmm. the ground and lifting it to full extension. Within that lift, there's no real time component that is critical, uh, meaning that there are plenty of people that are not particularly fast or explosive uh, or even would be traditionally concerned or, or uh, uh, considered athletic that can deadlift a house because there is time comparatively to recruit that. You've got a buildup over seconds in some case to get all of those muscle fibers contracting in unison. When we start looking at the physiological uh, attribute of power, there is a very distinct timing component that comes in. What we're talking about now is how many muscle fibers can I contract instantaneously or near instantaneously in unison. Mm. And that's a different physiological capability. So that's why you have somebody who may be an incredible deadlifter who is not an incredible clean or clean and jerk athlete. Mm -hmm. You can see that the opposite way too. You, have, you may have somebody who is incredibly explosive, but they cannot create as much high-end power or uh, strength rather uh, when you load up the bar beyond where they can be explosive. And so those two things are related and certainly there's a lot of overlap, but they're not the same things. And when you start getting into you know athletes that are primarily focused on strength expressions, what you see is that they may have their outlet competitively firmly rooted in one, you know, power lifter, they're looking for that strength, but many of them adopt explosive style movements to try to increase their power because they understand that it does have influence on their strength to some degree. The, the wonders and vice of variance. Versa. Exactly. And, and you see that, you, you know, the dynamic method in the West Side kind of school of thinking, um, you know, lower weights with more, um, emphasis on trying to lift quickly, that sort of thing. That's, that's very popular in a lot of strength uh, programs. And you see it the opposite way too. Athletes that have uh, a strength focus but are more explosive and, and interested in power development. We're talking athletes that throw, athletes that do uh, Olympic lifts competitively, things like that. Um, they will also incorporate pure strength movements because they do understand that there's a positive influence there to some degree. Mm -hmm. So again, if we break away and we think about these as two separate physiological developments, there's utility for training both, especially as CrossFitters who want that development across a broad spectrum of physical capabilities, you want to find both. Now, where that translates into a body weight application is when you start to see where kipping versus strict starts to fall out. When you have your body weight as the load, there's going to be different ways to try to manage this explosive type expression of power and a strict, more strength-oriented expression. So for example, strict pull-up is obviously going to be on that more kind of strength or stamina type, type of uh, um, development. 
getting into the KIP, I think sometimes the talking points revolve around more conditioning because I can use more muscle to continue longer than I might if I'm using just my arms and upper body alone. That's totally legitimate. But what gets maybe less talking point is this idea that an explosive, almost plyometric approach can have a good influence on strength and vice versa. And it's a different quality that you're developing with that different approach to the movement. And I think sometimes that doesn't get the, uh, the lip service that it's due. Uh, I think, you know, and we recorded the last show that we recorded about what is a CrossFitter. At some point in time, we talked in there about, about the wonders of variance and, you know, that the body's one piece and getting outside and, and entering different disciplines improves the other disciplines in a way that may not be readily apparent as to why that occurs, but it does. And I think that's the same thing, you know, Mike, you know, if you, if you are at the level athletically with your competence that you can safely execute both, you get strict, you get kipping, you're not in any danger of, you know, getting yourself into, into waters that you shouldn't because you're, you know, you don't have this good baseline of strength yet, but you're just kipping like a donkey up there in the bar, whatever <laughs> it happens to be, then, you know, I've been doing this for a long time been training a tremendous amount of athletes for a long time. Everyone, and I use that, you know, you know, 99.99% of the people that I've encountered are going to progress better, more efficiently, more effectively with their, let's just say their, their pull-ups journey, but this would apply to something else, by not just doing one style of the pull-up. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, again, exposing yourself. We're going to do strict, and we're going to do uh, kipping chin over bar. We're going to do kipping chest to bar. And then guess what? Even though this may make some longtime CrossFitters who consider themselves elite shudder, we're going to do ring rows because <sighs> ring rows are fantastic and infinitely scalable. And if you put your feet up on a box and you're parallel to the ground, I almost feel like they're more challenging than strict pull-ups and I reach fatigue faster and I'm pulling in a slightly different direction. And we're going to do bent over rows and we're going to do rope climbs and we're going to do mm -hmm. ring muscle ups and we're going to do low ring muscle ups from the ground with just barely a little bit of legs. So it becomes this really upper body dominated drill, but you're using just enough leg to finish the movement. So you're kind of pushing through that fatigue, all of those different ways to attacking it. And we're going to do weighted pull ups like these all it's not just this well, I'm going to do this one thing. And this is going to advance, but that has not been what I have found. I have found that mm. that slicing up that pie into as many intelligent slices as you can, and then serving them serving them out in an intelligently laid out order, serves most people the best. So I'm a I'm a huge huge fan of of attacking it with variants, and I've seen the benefits for years and years. Yeah, I agree. And uh, you know, again, to kind of draw this analogy between weightlifting and different approaches and then body weight training you know the challenge with body weight training is that you have a fixed level of resistance you know you weigh what you weigh and for most people from training session to training session that's going to be pretty consistent it's not going to be a radical difference between day one and day two mm -hmm. and that resistance so you have to find ways that you can intelligently use that resistance in ways that are going to be productive and not harmful and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that if somebody's really following the bouncing ball and they say, hey, why would you do a strict pull-up before a kipping pull-up? If I'm thinking about the push press, I could have somebody do a push press that doesn't have really any prerequisite strict upper body strength, but the caveat is that they're probably doing it at a reduced load or with mm -hmm. no load. You don't have that option with your body weight. And so for that reason, you have to be a little bit more I guess, judicious as to when you're going to have that full weight behind a dynamic explosive movement. But to think about it another way, uh, I like kind of playing this game with other pairings of movements because oftentimes I think people's thinking isn't very consistent and it can be easy to illustrate when you look at different movements. So when people talk to me about, well, kipping pull-ups are cheating or they're only quote for competition, I'm like, okay, cool, cool story. Let's, let's, look at a different pairing of movements. How about the air squat? I think everybody can see the utility in the air squat. Great. Now, how about being able to jump? Mm -hmm. Just using that same mechanic, basically jump. Mm 
Would there be any argument that one of those is appropriate, but one of those is not? Well, sure, you could find some circumstance if somebody's injured or whatever, where maybe jumping isn't appropriate. But with a healthy individual, most who's of the got population a, should be doing it. Exactly. A base level of, of conditioning, everybody's going to look at that and say, well, yeah, there's utility in squatting and there's utility in jumping and they develop different but similar things. And if you want a well-rounded fitness, yeah, you should probably be engaging in both. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a no-brainer. But for, for some reason, when we get into specifically upper body style explosive movements that only require your body weight, people don't seem to have that same consistency of thought. And to me, I think intuitively, it's because they recognize that all you have is the full body weight, and that's pretty advanced to be able to use your full body weight in those more explosive ways. So for that mm -hmm. reason, I guess it's another long-winded way of saying that, yeah, you need a certain requisite amount of strength before really diving into explosive body weight-oriented upper body movements, in my opinion. And maybe just to paint the, the picture of how circumventing that or or going dynamic sooner than you should could potentially lead you into trouble and i don't i don't want to be a liar and say that i didn't do this in my younger crossing days <laughs> but, but i'm guilty of it luckily nothing <laughs> bad happened i've seen plenty of other people uh, do it as well where you know we all have this this desire to rush into the what we think is the yeah. cool stuff we don't want to spend sure. our time on the basics the basics are boring they don't look good on instagram give me the flash give me the sizzle get me on those rings. I want to ring muscle up tomorrow. Well, hey, your ring dips are really terrible, you know, and um, <laughs> and you're not good at upper body pulling. Look, shut your mouth. I want to, I want to ring muscle <laughs> up. Going, I want it I'm tomorrow. going for it. I got hip drive like you never heard of. Let's get it on. <laughs> and and if, you know, you get up there and with somebody that, that does have that pop, they might just launch themselves if they get lucky and time it right and fire it right up on the rings rather unexpectedly, almost by surprise. And then if you don't have the actual strength to control those rings and keep them tight, you might spill through. One arm might go in a way that you don't want. Your body's going down. You panic. You still hold on to a ring. Now that heart and like, there's just nothing good about it. And especially in that movement, you know, the dynamic movement in that, like I just said there, is almost more demanding, right? Because if you're doing slow controlled ring dips, well, they're just, they're slow and controlled. If you aggressively tip yourself into the bottom of a muscle up, you're going to get there in a hurry, and the demands to like to control that mm -hmm. are going to be more significant than you doing slow, controlled, rhythmic ring dips. Or right, so you need to have that base, or you know, it could potentially be a bad day in the gym. I don't want to see that happen to anybody. So it's always a good idea just to lay that groundwork first. So when you start to advance in speed, velocity, technique, complexity, whatever it happens to be, you're doing it, at least you've set yourself up for the greatest amount of success possible. So I think that's yeah. the crawl, walk, run approach there. Well, let me tell you, Pat, I'm no chef, but if you were coming over to my house for dinner and I was trying to impress you with a world-class meal and you asked me a question about where did you source these ingredients? And I said, well, I got the, uh, I got the meat in the dollar bin at, at uh, Walmart. Girl, awesome. The starting point is not <laughs> going to set me up for awesome. my goal, which is a world-class meal for my friend yeah. Pat. Just season it's not it. going to happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's no, there's no Mrs. Dash that's going to uh, mask that. So I think it's very similar. You know, If you're starting off with the ingredients, it might be a little subpar, the combination is not going to magically come together in any way that, uh, that, that is better. You know, what's interesting too is let's, let's say that you've, you've worked this process and, and you've got yourself some strict pull-ups, you've developed kipping technique, you're, you're comfortable with both, you're starting to flow them back, um, back and forth in workouts. And I'll say, you know, because also part of his question was how often should one be done over the other? I can't tell you it's it's a one to one, it's a two to one, it's a three to one ratio or whatnot, but I can tell you that you should be doing both. And and I even will allow myself, mm -hmm. probably also because I really like strict pull-ups, but I'll do them every now and then in workouts that call for kipping, understanding that I'll be a little bit slower. But yep. I feel like, you know what, I haven't worked some stricties in a while. I'm gonna just do them strict mm -hmm. today. I'm gonna my fitness is gonna be fine. It's gonna take me a little bit longer. I gotta rest a bit more. Whoop do you do? Who cares? And if the sets are, are low enough, it may actually not slow me down that much, you know, given whatever your pull-up capacity happens to be. 
But if you have the capacity, let me, I'll give you two workouts so you, maybe people can see how both have their place really nice. So I did a workout yesterday, as a matter of fact. You should do it because it's terrible. That's what every CrossFit <laughs> says, says to their friend. <laughs> wait, it, wait, wait. We forgot to bring that up in our discussion of what it means to be a CrossFitter. I think that's, that's right. right there is, is this, I did this, this awful thing. Sucked. You should, you do, should it do it too. Uh, <laughs> that's up on the list for sure. It, it, it still would have been a good workout with strict pull-ups, but it would have been different and wouldn't have developed the, the intended stimulus. The intended stimulus was to have you feel as if you had been doused in kerosene and somebody had struck a match <laughs> and, and threw it on you. Oh, so boy. it was it was 2159, that old classic friend of a kipping chin over bar pull up okay. and the old old school burpee. That's it. Uh, yeah. No, that's that's it. I know exactly where that's going. That's especially for a skinny that's guy it. like me who's pretty good at both of those movements. I know how that ends. That's and, no and no. I specifically put the pull ups First, so think about like Fran. and Fran, mm -hmm. the thrusters come first, the pull-ups come second. Well, I've thought about these two movements. You're not going to fail a burpee. They might slow right. down. They might turn right. into grief burpees. But then you have a chance of failing the pull-ups. So put them first to give you the yep. greatest opportunity to, to keep the pedal Ugh. down. And so it was disgusting and awful. And, and it, it, it burned. It burned um, quite badly. And it delivered <laughs> the goods. That same workout... Would it have been a good workout with strict pull-ups? It certainly would. You'd be doing pull-ups and burpees. Yeah. You're winning Great. on the face mm -hmm. of the earth, but it wouldn't have delivered that, like, I want you to feel like you just did a hard 800-meter sprint. It wouldn't have done that. And that was the actual yeah. intent for that day. There's a workout program that's coming up in a couple of weeks that has a very different stimulus, but also has pull-ups in it. It's 10 rounds, if I remember correctly, and I, I think I said you can do it for time or not. So don't worry about running the clock if you don't want to run the clock. And it's 10 rounds of 30 double unders, 15 sit-ups, and five weighted pull-ups. So again, I also I gave people the option not to run the clock because the goal that day is, yeah, there's double unders, yeah, there's midline, but the goal that day is to work on your weighted strict pull-ups. And mm. so if you're rushing the clock, you might be too concerned with the clock, and now I'm not gonna try to like put a good load on me. But that's not what we want, you know? Move at a good pace, do your set of five, and that lower number over the course of 10, so we'll get in 50, we'll get in 10 sets of five. And that day, you're not gonna feel like you ran an 800 meter dash. It's not the intent of that day. Mm -hmm. So strict pull-ups and, you know, strict pull-ups in one session, kipping pull-ups in another session. And once you have these tools in your tool bag and you have athletes that have the appropriate capacity to be exposed to both, you're gonna be able to make a far better, more well-rounded, more capable athlete than if they didn't have the ability to go in all these different directions of variance. And so getting back to what we said earlier about how great variance is and, and dabbling your toe in these different waters, putting your time in, in that crawl, walk, run, you know, don't be in a rush to get there you will just rocket and propel your fitness forward. So the the time you're spending is worth it, in my opinion. Yeah, I think so too. And to jump in on some thoughts that I had as you were talking through a few of these workouts, instantly that 21-15-9 that you talked about to That's convert that to a strict, yeah. I, you know, there's plenty of ways that you could skin that cat to get some strict work in that would also be a little bit more demanding of kind of higher heart rate, you know, more fatigue factor. You can split that into three sets of seven, three sets of five, three sets of three, so that you're less likely to fail on those sets of pull-ups mm -hmm. and you kind of right back to it when you do them strict. That's That might be one way to approach it. And then to zoom out and think about that more holistically, um, you know, I do think that there's utility to putting some of that strict work in there during a more, quote, conditioning-oriented workout. And defaulting to kipping all the time is maybe not the best approach. I think there's a bit of a perverse incentive sometimes when you're looking at only the clock. And it, when it says pull-ups, mm -hmm. you, all you think about is I just want to maximize my time to finish. Okay, that's, that's appropriate sometimes. But just like sometimes it's appropriate to do a workout, for example, that might be like three rounds of 800-meter run followed by five 315-pound deadlifts. That's a stout deadlift done at a modest amount of reps with a high intensity, you know, run added in there. That's a pretty mm -hmm. difficult, demanding kind of, you know, mixed mode workout. 
you could take that same approach with the body weight training and say, okay, I'm going to do 800 meter run and five strict pull-ups, or maybe it's a few more if you're good at them, uh, as opposed to 800 meter run, 20 kipping pull-ups, because I know I can just bang them out. Right. So <clears throat> in the same way that I would modulate a workout with the running and deadlifts, I could kind of pick the, the development that I want to get out of it based on the reps and the loading. I might take that way down and make the reps higher if I want more of that overall conditioning element and not the challenge of strength at a high heart rate. I could do that same thing with, with pull-ups, but oftentimes people just default to not thinking about it and not adding that variety, which is a bit of a shame. You know, If you have that, go back to the analogy, if you have that ingredient on the shelf, why not use it from time to time? Don't forget about it. No, agreed. So, um, and with regards to you know developing one or the other, you know, a lot of the things that I just mm -hmm. mentioned previously, uh, from you know the the ring rows, bands are fantastic oh, yeah. as well. You know you yep. can use bands in any of these situations that we just said, and and as we've said previously, if there are pull ups in the workout, you know, and I'm kind of piggybacking on what you just said of like, hey, it's okay to do strict every now and then, even what would be considered, hey, I'm trying to push the pace, right? Because this is what makes programming think about this stuff so interesting. It's like, well, why are there pull-ups in there? Most likely, there are pull-ups in there as part of your strength and conditioning program to help increase and develop your upper body pulling capacity. And so even doing like strict pulls, okay, well, it took me a little bit longer. Yes, but did you, the goal was also to have one of these movements increase your upper body pulling capacity. You did mm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it took you 90 seconds longer than your buddy. Who cares? So, yeah. You won. Yep. It's not the um, point. Yep. I had something is totally gone because so I got myself on a tangent and then I went on a different <laughs> tangent and it's gone. But um, no, that's so I would say my closing thought would be almost any, this is a broad sweeping generalization, almost anybody would benefit from giving their strict pull-ups a bit more love. You know, I don't want to speak for the whole cross community, but, yeah. but, but kipping pull-ups are great and it can be really easy to never go back to the quote unquote simpler movement because it's going to slow me down because my time's not going to be as cool. Uh, given your strict pull-ups some love, I don't think is going to negatively affect you. I think it will positively affect you. So that would be my recommendation. Yeah. And it, it really does boil back down to kind of core CrossFit ethos, which is you don't want any weaknesses. And so if you can blast out a set of 30 kipping, but you struggle with a set of five strict, I mean, that's a pretty obvious indicator that one of those is a weakness and you need to spend some time bringing that back up uh, and vice versa. If you're somebody that can just crank out strict all day, but you don't have the coordination to get your chin over the bar when the hips involved, well, there you go. That's a pretty clear indicator that maybe you need to spend some time and figure that out. Um, and once you get to that point that you're competent in both, you'll find that they do start to have a better influence on one another. And that's re really where the sweet spot is, is when you start to say, okay, I haven't done strict in a while, but I've kipped a bunch. Then you go back and retest your strict and you're like, dude, I got two more than I, I did before. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then maybe you see that sometimes on the other end where people are like, you know what? I don't want to practice strict for a while or uh, kipping for a while. I'm just going to go back to strict. And then because they're competent with the kip, even if they haven't seen it in a while, when they get back to that, they're like, man, kipping pull-ups are just like child's play at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's the sweet spot is when you have enough base competency in both that they start to have this really nice positive overlap. So yeah, strict movements are cool. <laughs> sure are. <Yeah. laughs> so are kipping movements. <laughs> yep, 100%. Yep. So, all right, well, hopefully... Hopefully that helps, you know, hopefully helps the, the average Joe get back on track with the kipping and the strict because there's there's a place for both. They have, there's wonderful benefit and they they both help each other uh, advance forward. So kipping and strict, I mean, talk about a topic that people just love to to chop it up about. Oh, so if, it's eternal. If, well, well, I mean, this is something that will be... We'll come uh, back to it. Absolutely. Yep. So if anybody watching or listening has, you know, some good deep-seated thoughts one way or the other... Find this show on the BTWB YouTube channel. Post your thoughts, your two cents there in the comments. I'd love to hear the interplay and what your personal experience is. And as we always say, uh, check out the VNR Cycles. Want to help support the show? All kinds of good stuff. Ways to get your first strict pull-up, ring dip, handstand walk, uh, some barbell work, you name it. For Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we will see you next time.